Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. It's been 20 years since the U.S. invaded Afghanistan. As the U.S. handed the country over to the Taliban, their control over Afghanistan has been portrayed as inevitable. But was it? The war on Afghanistan didn't really start in 2001. U.S. meddling goes back to the 1970s and Western meddling as far back as 100 years. Most people have no idea that there have been Afghans who tried to modernize their country, including a communist movement that was crushed by imperialist powers, who supported conservative men that threw acid in women's faces. Anything to prevent the rise of communism in a global South country. To make sense of it all, and to uncover some of that buried history, I'm joined by Vijay Prashad, executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and author of the cover story in Frontline, entitled Afghanistan's Long Struggle with Reforms and Conservatism. Vijay, welcome. Great to be with you. Thanks a lot. It's so great to have you on to talk about this issue, particularly at this time when we're commemorating the 20 years uh, following the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. And, you know, I I just want to start off by quoting directly from your piece, because I think it's a good uh, jumping off point. And you write that from 1919 to the present day, Afghanistan has struggled between reform and reaction. The latter used effectively by imperial powers to undermine the sovereignty of the country. And, you know, it kind of made me think of Marx saying, you know, how history repeats itself, you know, first as a tragedy, then as farce. But this seems almost like serial murder uh, when you think about it, uh, just because it's, you know, over and over. It's kind of like this awful time loop with Afghanistan. But I guess, can you start off by maybe discussing the history of Western intervention in Afghanistan and how you believe it changed the country's trajectory? Well, the first thing I want to say is that um, between the 1920s and the 1990s, Afghanistan had not one, not two, not three, but four constitutions. Now, a constitution is a good place to start when you look at a country's dynamic, its trajectory, and so on. The first major modern constitution, Rania, was in 1923. And in that constitution, in 1923, the people, mostly the liberal aristocracy and others, committed Afghanistan to a policy of equality between men and women, um, education, healthcare reform, and so on. Now, Obviously, the constitution was delivered by a king, King Amanullah. Yes, certainly when they said equality, they had other ideas in mind. But nonetheless, there was a formal commitment to equality. Uh, That was reinforced in 1964, a very important constitution that actually opened the door for elections. And in 1965, there was, you know, elections in the country. Four women were elected to parliament, including a, a communist. Uh, There was another constitution in 1976. These constitutions, 23, um, 64, 76, these were not pushed forward by the left. These were pushed forward by liberals, aristocrats, and the left, you know, working together. And they really wanted to provide Afghanistan with a future. You know, uh, again, the core questions, the three core questions for any modern government Eradicate hunger, get rid of illiteracy, and make sure you can contain sickness, you know, create some sort of healthcare infrastructure. Around that, you've got to build the infrastructure of the country, build the roads, you know, build the, the, the schools, of course, build some industry, agriculture, dignity for people. I mean, the whole package, it was there. Um, in 1973, there was essentially a liberal coup when Muhammad Daud overthrew the king, King Zahir Shah, and took control. Now, very interesting, you know, the communists come to power in April of 1978. We're talking about 1973, when the liberals took power. When Muhammad Daud took power, he turned his eyes at the university. Because at Kabul University, there was a core group of people who were the leadership of the Jamaati Islami. Um, This is a political organization you know, inspired to a large extent by Saudi Arabia, uh, backed by sections of Diobandi mullahs from Pakistan and so on. They were led by a man by the name of Burhanuddin Rabani. Now, it's really quite fascinating. And, and 
because this story goes back to the 19 early 1970s it should give people a sense of what the contest was about it was not actually initially between communism and imperialism it was between liberalism uh, mm -hmm. liber afghan liberalism and the imperialist powers so you know here's mohammed daud comes in he's the head of the government he targets the islamists and says look guys you can't be going around saying women can't have education you know, Rabani's number two was Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, who's still around in Kabul today, a nasty piece of work, you know. His other fellow was Ahmad Shah Masood, who people began to see as a great hero, but was a nasty piece of work. These fellows fled across the border to Pakistan, and they took up residence uh, in Peshawar, in Baluchistan, in sections of Waziristan, and so on. They fled Afghanistan, not after the communist coup, but after the liberals came to power. In Pakistan, uh, they found no friends because at the time in Pakistan, there was a relatively socialist government uh, led by you know, Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. So from the early 70s, they tried to do some things in Afghanistan, but they couldn't really move an agenda. Um, mm -hmm. The Saudis had a massive influx of oil revenue after the 1973 oil shock. So the Saudis started to fund schools and started to fund a lot of the kind of institutional apparatus for what would become the Mujahideen, led mm -hmm. by people like Burhanuddin Rabani and so on. After the overthrow of Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and his assassination by the very right-wing military dictator Zia ul Haq, a, a, a military coup backed by the US government in 1977, after Zia came in, they put a lot of resources into Rabani and this gang of thugs. And then this gang of thugs started to go and start building their operations inside Afghanistan. Again, Rania, this is before the communists take power in April 1978. When the communists take power in April 1978, they try to deep, deepen the reform agenda. One of the things they do is they send tens of thousands of young people in a mass literacy campaign because they realize you know, when literacy levels are at four or five percent, it's it's obscene. You know, you've got to lift mm -hmm. that. Thousands of young, tens of thousands of young people went around the countryside to lead a literacy campaign. That was one of the first mass campaigns of the communists. And what did the Pakistanis, the CIA, the Saudis, what did they do with this so-called Mujahideen? These Mujahideen gangsters crossed the border and started killing these literacy workers. That was the beginning of their so-called freedom movement in Afghanistan. That was entirely backed by Washington, D.C. And I want to underline this so there's no confusion. Washington, D.C. joined forces with the Saudi royal family, with a dictator, military dictator in Pakistan, not to undermine the Afghan communists, but to first undermine Afghan liberalism. Even liberalism was intolerable to them. That's pretty incredible. Um... Just, the, I mean, thinking about the idea that I've, I've actually heard the literacy program portrayed in a negative light by people who are just, they attach the entire Afghan movement uh, for communism to the Soviets. Like it wasn't anything local whatsoever. It was just sort of some, you know, awful Soviet campaign to occupy the country. And that's how it's portrayed. And I actually remember, I don't remember who wrote it, but I remember reading a piece where somebody is talk is relaying how like somebody from the countryside in Afghanistan is relaying these literacy programs of having been evil. They came with guns and forced us, <laughs> forced us to go to school. But I wanted to ask you, you know, on that issue, why? Like, why the opposition to even liberalism? Why was literacy promotion such a threat uh, to, first of all, I guess, such a threat to the local, you know, landlords and local clergy who were so opposed to it? Why were they so opposed to it locally? And then why was that such a threat to the U.S. and to Saudi Arabia and to all these powers that, you know, funded this group to destroy this literacy program? You know, this is an excellent question. And this should be the question that a journalist stands up and asks Joe Biden or asks <laughs> Barack Obama or Donald Trump or go all the way back, you know, actually go all the way back to Richard Nixon and, and, and to Jimmy Carter, you know, who Jimmy Carter's government is the one that really started to finance the Mujahideen. They need to answer this question, you know, so do the, the royals in Saudi Arabia. 
But since they're not on your program, let me give it a try. You know, I mean, I'm, <laughs> yes, I'm going to try to analyze it on their behalf. Um, <laughs> Thank look, you, Vijay. Uh, yeah, it's pretty clear, Rania, why the landlords, uh, the, the landlords in most of Afghanistan, combination with the mullahs, you know, uh, but not all, all the religious figures, but a large section of mullahs and landlords and so on, and sections of the aristocracy certainly didn't want any democratization in Afghanistan. That was a threat to their authority. You know, land reform would have been an abomination for the royal families and for um, for the landlords. So you can understand why the elites in Afghanistan were not interested. You see, Muhammad Daoud, the liberal uh, head of government before the communists, he wanted to drive this agenda because he wanted to modernize his country. You know, he wanted to have um, you know industry. He wanted to have better infrastructure. He, he wanted to live in a modern country. That's what motivated him. What motivated the communists was the mere sense that everybody should have education, health care, people should not be hungry and so on, and that there should be a system where people are rewarded for their labor. Either way, they had an agenda. And you can see why the landlords and the mullahs opposed this. That's one thing. Um, you can understand why the United States opposed this. And, and so too, therefore, their Saudi and uh, Pakistani allies. Uh, there's two reasons why this group of people opposed the uh, agenda of liberalism and the left in Afghanistan. Two reasons. The first reason is, of course, bordering Afghanistan just north of the Amu Darya was the USSR, the Soviet Union. And there was a great fear that the Soviet Union had made Afghanistan a client state. Now, it should be said that after the revolution in the Tsarist Empire, the um, Soviet government went to Brest Litovsk, signed a deal with the you know Axis power saying we're leaving World War I, what would be called later World War I. In that Brest Litovsk agreement, uh, the Soviets insisted that Persia, today's Iran, and Afghanistan must be independent sovereign states. Uh, as a consequence of that, of, of that demand that the Soviets made, uh, Lenin, who was the head of government in the USSR, opened a, um, a correspondence with King Amanullah of Afghanistan. They wrote to each other and the Soviets said, look, we want you to be an independent state. We, we, we have no interest in um, overrunning Afghanistan. We have problems in Central Asia. We don't want to enter Afghanistan, uh, but we want you to be an independent state. This Amanullah greatly appreciated. And what one sees after that is a lot of Soviet, Soviet assistance inside uh, Afghanistan from the 1920s, in fact, right to the 1990s and, and you know, even later. Um, this Soviet assistance, Rania, included in 1950s, all the roads in Kabul were paved by Soviet engineers. Soviet mm -hmm. equipment crossed the Amudarya. That was an intervention. They crossed the Amudarya, they came to Kabul and they paved all the roads. I mean, I remember uh, talking to people uh, about this old timers in Kabul who, who remembered um, the Soviet equipment in the city, um, you know, building their roads. That was in the 1950s. That was at a time when it was a monarchy. Uh, there was a very close relationship with the USSR and Afghanistan, but it was not a client state by any imagination. The United States by the 1970s, particularly when there was this stirring movement in Iran, um, and suddenly after the Iranian revolution in 1979, the attempted revolution in Pakistan that same year, um, very much an upsurge from below. Um, when these things happened, the Saudis were scared and so was the United States that the Soviets were somehow going to come into Iran, uh, come into Afghanistan and then Iran and threaten <laughs> uh, Saudi Arabia. And they wanted to block it. So at any cost, they, they were at any cost going to undermine both the liberal government in Afghanistan that had close ties with the USSR and then certainly the communist government. So I think that's really what was motivating um, these outside forces. Pakistan, it should be said, was really operating at, at two levels. One, it operated as on the behest or, or you know, doing the work of the United States government. But secondly, you see, Pakistan and Afghanistan have a long-standing problem. In 1893, the British drew a line um, through that uh, northern region of, of what was then British India. It was called the Durant Line. The Durant Line went right through the homeland of the Pashto-speaking people or the Pathans. Uh, 
um, there's a very large section of Pathans live in Pakistan and some live in Afghanistan. Um, till today, the Afghans and the Pakistanis have not agreed on that border. And this demand for Pakhtunistan or the land of the Pashtuns remains a living uh, sense in, in, in that region. So Pakistan has always played a game in Afghanistan to prevent a strong government in Kabul that would then uh, try to fix the borders. Now, um, that's a small motivation for Pakistan. It's not actually a big motivation. The real thing was that Pakistan put itself at the service of the United States and was, you know, lavishly rewarded for a time by Saudi Arabia. My goodness, like if we if we had a dollar for every place the British drew a line, um, <laughs> that is still causing conflict today. We'd be rich. Uh, so, you know, building off of that, um, you, you, you know, there was this socialist communist movement that arose in Afghanistan um, on top of this sort of liberalism that you're talking about. And so I think that this is something that um, it should be very interesting for any leftist around the world, but particularly the Western left. There was a leftist movement in Afghanistan that had power for a little bit of time. So can you talk about Afghanistan socialist movement? You know, how did it come to be? What did it accomplish in the time that it had some power? And then, of course, why did it ultimately fail, which we've already kind of touched on a little bit, but we can go more into that. Yeah. So, again, because of this correspondence between Lenin and um, Amanullah, King, King Amanullah, the Soviets and the Communist International didn't actually drive a hard agenda to create a communist party in Afghanistan. Um, you know, the Indian Communist Party was founded in Tashkent, just across the border from Afghanistan in the USSR. And Indian communists were sitting in Kabul. Uh, they had gone up, you know, from Peshawar, in fact, and across the Khyber uh, into Kabul. And that's where they regrouped. And the Indian communists came back to India from there. It's a separate issue. The point is there was no Afghan Communist Party. The Afghan Communist Party is first founded in 1964 after the constitution of 1964. It, just imagine that. It borders the USSR and there was no left party. There was a communist party in Iran, um, even though the Iranians had been told essentially that it should be a sovereign state nonetheless. But in Afghanistan, there was not. Not because the Afghans were not capable of it. You know, There's a lot of really racist talk about Afghanistan as this barbaric backward place. No understanding of you know, how remarkable and incredible is its history. You know, the brief bits I'm telling you, it's quite remarkable, the history mm -hmm. of Afghanistan. Um, there is this old racist idea that comes from British ideas of the Afghan as a kind of noble savage. It's nothing further from the truth, you know, uh, in that. Anyway, the point is that when the Communist Party is created in 64, there are various factions, as in any party. Um, the, the faction that was not dominant, but was really quite, um, you know, moving an agenda, was a faction that was led partly by a friend of mine, Anahita Ratebzad, who was one of the first four women to enter parliament in 1965. Um, they were the faction that believed in a united front policy, a building power with the liberal factions and so on, driving a broad Afghan patriotic or national development agenda. Then there was a kind of a couple of ultra left factions. One group became a Maoist group and actually later would turn against um, the left wing government in Kabul. <laughs> uh, they, were, they were kind of a very nutty Maoist group and small section and so on. But there was a, a section of the of the communist movement that was very sectarian, led by a, an extraordinarily good writer, Hafizullah Amin. Um, he had made his living as a short story writer, wrote with great feeling about the suffering of people and so on. Um, and uh, and Tariki and, and Hafizullah Amin were the two. Uh, Tariki, the great writer, sorry. Um, and so you had a situation where inside Afghanistan, uh, inside the left, there was great dispute and disagreement. This disagreement came to a head after 1978. Uh, after the, the, the coup, after the takeover. You see, that coup was facilitated by a very simple fact. Remember, I'd said that the Afghans got a lot of assistance from the USSR. Uh, most of Afghanistan's army was trained in the USSR. And, you know, the Marxists basically dominated the army. So when the coup took place in April of 1978, the army played a major role there. But they immediately handed over part to the civilian 
um, a political party, you know, and that's when the, they created essentially a democratic republic in Afghanistan. They, it was a civilian government. But inside the left, there was this dispute. There was often an accusation that one of the main left leaders was a CIA agent and so on. There were gunfights inside um, the, the, the uh, presidential um, buildings. And, you know, there was a lot of factionalism for sure. Um, but by the 19, by 79, 80 or thereabouts, some of the factionalism had eased up. When Babak Kamal comes to power, um, you know, he frees uh, people from prison. Uh, they open an agenda up. But, you know, it's too late, actually, Rania. By the time Kamal comes to power, Anahita, you know, is a major figure in the government. It's too late because what has happened is in the as a consequence of the massive backing by the U.S., Saudis, Pakistanis and others, um, the Mujahideen had started to disrupt the countryside, come in and start a massive killing spree. That was happening on one side. Secondly, the government of Amin and Tariki, um, uh, ultra-left government, had really cracked down against their own comrades, throwing them in prison and so on, demoralized people. <sighs> Combination of these two things, when Kamal comes to power and tries to settle everything, you know, tries to ease everything up, they feel that they are under great threat. And they ask the Soviets to intervene. Now, this mm. is an interesting thing that's often not remarked upon. The Soviet Politburo debated intervening for months. Uh, and now we have all the Politburo notes. These were uh, uh, released you know, after the Soviet Union fell. And you, you, you can listen to the voices of the Politburo members saying, we don't want to enter. Wow. But they feared two things. They feared two repeat of two events. Uh, they, they feared what happened in Chile in 1973. Uh, that was fresh on their minds, you know, the overthrow of the government of Salvador Allende, the coup by um, Augusto Pinochet, the mass slaughter of the left and so on. That was fresh on their minds. They, then they talked about it. Also fresh on their minds was the massacre of communists in Indonesia in 1965. Yeah. You know, yeah. these two things were in the air. And so they reluctantly crossed the Amudarya into, uh, into Afghanistan. And, and what's interesting is, you know, I, I was not there at the time. But what old journalists and others, uh, you, you know, say, not the Western journalists, but journalists <laughs> who were in Kabul and so on, what they say is, in fact, the Soviets didn't much go into the front line uh, to fight the Mujahideen. They mainly stayed um, doing a lot of kind of, uh, you know, training work and so on. They were not that much present in the front line, although they were. It's not that they were not, but they were not like enormous. They were not doing the bulk of the fighting. That was done by that Afghan army. And I got to say that after the Soviets withdrew um, by 88, 89, after the Soviets withdrew, remember the communist government actually stays in power till 1996. That's when Mohammad Najibullah, the last left wing president, is assassinated by the Taliban. He and his brother were strung up and killed by the Taliban in 1996. They were pulled out of a UN compound. But for the period of six and a half years, the communists stayed effectively not in power because it was a civil war it was chaos but the army didn't collapse you know uh, unlike the, this Ashraf Ghani's army which collapsed in 11 days there was no collapse uh, so the point I want to make is the communists were in power they drove a very good agenda of, of you know reform education reform healthcare reform trying to increase food production you know, uh, the, the question of women's rights was front and center. You know, in, in fact, uh, when I met Anahita later, uh, she was quite clear that, you know, hey, listen, she, she told me every edict that I pushed, you know, right of women to divorce uh, freely, right of women to inheritance and so on. Everything she said I pushed was there essentially in the 76, 1976 constitution and in the 1977 civil law. She said, you know, we were just enacting the bourgeois law. Um, it's not like we were pushing. The bourgeois law said women and men are equal and equal as well in inheritance. So nobody applied it. We were going to apply it for God's sake. And, and you know, then they were said they are evil. They are out of touch with their country. Out of touch with the country. It's the constitution for God's sake. You know, how are they out of touch? They were definitely out of touch with the landlords. And definitely out of touch with the reactionary mullahs. That's true. But out of touch with the country, how? They enacted the constitution of 1976, for God's sake. Uh, this is a point that I don't hear getting made at all. Because people 
have this assumption that out of touch communists come to power in kabul and then they start pushing a hard left agenda which alienates them from the people nothing is further from th- than that from the truth well and of course that goes into of course what the who the reactionaries were getting support from and i mean all we can really do is speculate when i ask you this but you know we know that this was one of the biggest covert programs in american history this arming and funding of the mujahideen starting in 1979 even before the soviets got involved right this uh was the the you know crafted by uh big new brzezinski famously um in, in an effort to draw the soviets into their very own vietnam or you know all the things that we hear about now but like you said yeah it's this narrative of oh these out of touch soviet backed communists you know went into the countryside and tried to force modernity onto the backwards afghans then that's that's still how afghanistan is actually portrayed now that the taliban has retaken a lot of the country but i actually am curious you know at the time if you go back and read what people were writing like was there any opposition to this from the international left cuz i know the us left if i go back and read what they were talking about seemed like they were almost supportive of the mujahideen because there was such a good propaganda effort to portray them as these freedom fighters and that really worked in the us i'm curious if that worked on an international level um you know where the you were mentioned journalists at the time in kabul had a different view of you know even the soviet troops that were there than you might get from from westerners so did, did, was there an understanding of what the us was backing of what this mujahideen actually was that they weren't quite freedom fighters or was it similar to syria now or the last 10 years where like there's all this international propaganda to the point where you've got like al qaeda in syria being propped up as freedom fighters so i mean i i can't speak to everything that you're saying because <laughs> I, i don't know the entirety of the us left at the time but i do know that philip klonsky uh, was in kabul uh, spent a long time there reporting for the people's weekly world which was the newspaper of the communist party in the united states and klonsky was you know offering the story from kabul saying look you know this is the government this is their agenda today i interviewed somebody who is the minister of agriculture they're conducting land reform next day the klonsky's reporting was superb um you know he was talking to the people in the government he was talking to ordinary afghans he was writing it as he saw it i i think his work was excellent uh, in that period so i wouldn't you know throw a blanket over it i think in the international left at the time there was some confusion when the soviet center um because um you know this was not the first soviet intervention that became a, a international issue the first was in 1956 when the soviets entered hungary the second right. was when soviet tanks entered czechoslovakia there was an intervention in poland but these three were the big international you know uh, scandals as it were 56 hungary which had a there was a break in the in the left in in particularly in the west the creation of the new left emerges after that you know edward thompson and all of them leave the british communist party after 56 68 was you know seen as a as a horrible intervention because it was to put down the government of mr dubček who said i want socialism with a human face and so on so given the history of hungary and czechoslovakia and whatever differences of opinion people had about those two interventions this intervention was seen in that lens which i think mm-hmm. given the fact that the soviets didn't publicly say we are really in two minds about this um, what we learn later was that the afghan intervention was nothing like the intervention in in hungary and in in czechoslovakia this was of a different character here the soviets actually feared that there would be a bloodbath this was actually a little bit and and i don't want to overdo the comparison this was a little bit like the vietnamese military that entered cambodia to stop the killing fields um mm. you know w- when the vietnamese entered cambodia to stop the killing field the whole point of that intervention was that there was a genocide going on and 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 vietnam came in um i mean i, I don't know anybody who criticizes that intervention rania that was an mm. act of extreme heroism by the vietnamese people um you know it was the united states that actually backed pol pot uh, this issue that people may be confused about Paul Pot was yes a man of the left but he was backed by the US government he had lost his head i mean what they did in 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 cambodia was a horrendous genocide and the vietnamese put a stop to it by intervening and and i think 
in a way, the Soviets were not able to make the case for what they were doing and therefore, you know, appeared like just another uh, imperial force entering. And therefore, you know, just as the British lost twice and the Soviets yeah. lost once. And, and this very tired and erroneous phrase that Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. <laughs> you know, because in fact... There's a big difference between British imperial interventions in the 19th century and early 20th century. There were three wars the British fought, um, 1842, 1878, 1880, and then 1919. And they got defeated in 1919, by the way. Uh, they fought three wars. Um, the Soviet entry was not like the British entry. It came in there to support this government and to support the left. Um, I think it was, on, in retrospect, I think we should say it was a miscalculation that Andropov and others had been right earlier to caution we shouldn't enter Afghanistan. It was a miscalculation. Um, I don't think they should have entered. I think there were other ways to go. Um, now, we have the benefit of hindsight um, yeah. and so on. But I should also say, it's not just hindsight. As I had said earlier, the members of the Politburo and the Standing Committee made arguments at the time, don't intervene. In fact, the KGB also made arguments, don't intervene. So... I don't think it's merely hindsight. You know, I think we have to look back and see that record. And, and also, I think, be very honest, Rania, that it was perhaps not the best thing uh, mm. for, for the region at all, for the Soviet troops to cross the Amu Darya in such large numbers. Yeah. I mean, no, I think that's a fair assessment. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Is that this this parallel between I hate this parallel between the Soviets and then what the U.S. did in 2001. There's no parallel. And I kind of want to bring it to that because, you know, when we talk about what the U.S. did in the 80s, it's never I mean, it's amazing how till this day the U.S. invaded Afghanistan because the Taliban and Al Qaeda and 9-11, but it's never connected to the 1980s. And the idea, you know, the fact that had you not had a uh, U.S. intervention in Afghanistan in the 80s that supported these reactionaries, you likely wouldn't have had a 9-11 or a rise of the Taliban, which I just want to clarify, you know, the Taliban is not the same as the Mujahideen. The Taliban, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, they come from the refugee camps in Peshawar uh, that the Mujahideen was in charge of where, where, you know, you had all the Saudi funding going to Islamic, uh, madrasas in these, in these, uh, in these refugee camps. And then later they would come in in the nineties and take over the country from the Mujahideen, which had created just utter chaos and violence. And I want to quote what you, what you say in your piece about this, because it's related to when the U S invades is you write in 1993, the Office of Research and Decrees of the Supreme Court of the Islamic State of Afghanistan, the Mujahideen's government, said that, quote, women need not go out of their homes at all. Schools are whorehouses, the decree stated, and centers of adultery and fornification. This was all before the Taliban came to power. These were the U.S.-backed Mujahideen who would then refashion themselves as the Northern Alliance in 2001. And that's from your piece which I encourage people to go check out in, in, in Frontline. But, you know, the, the point of me saying this is that you mentioned, okay, the, the, that sounds pretty Taliban-like to me, this idea of, you know, schools are whorehouses, women shouldn't go to them. Um, but then the U.S. in 2001 invades Afghanistan, you know, briefly gets rid of the Taliban or pushes out the Taliban and then puts this Northern Alliance back in power. And so, uh, you know, that was supposedly better for women. So, you know, but of course, what, what you say here in this piece uh, suggests otherwise. So can, can you just briefly discuss, I mean, who the U.S. put in power when they invaded in 2001 um, after a terrorist attack in America that took place at the hands of people that literally wouldn't exist without American intervention 20 years earlier? Or 10 right. Years I mean, earlier. let's just be clear. The 9-11 <laughs> attack took place because U.S. troops entered Saudi Arabia in 1990-91 to eject Saddam Hussein's forces from Kuwait. Um, the attack on, on the United States had nothing to do with Afghanistan. Uh, it was exactly. Osama bin Laden's anger that there was um, United States troops in the great land of, of, of his ancestors. And he was very upset by that. He went and argued with the royal family and said that these soldiers should leave. He, he fell out with the royal family, fled to Sudan, then eventually he comes back to Afghanistan where he had been fighting alongside the CIA uh, against the Soviets. So actually, <laughs> the, the drama is crazy. Yeah, it, but it had nothing to do with Afghanistan. I mean, Afghanistan wasn't the, the 
cause for the creation of Al Qaeda. It was just where Al Qaeda took refuge. Well, it certainly, it certainly, it certainly was like in the chain of events, right? Like it's like where these people met these Afghan Arabs. They met in Afghanistan, fighting alongside the CIA. And again, it's just speculation. Like maybe 9/11 still would have happened, but there's a chance it might have not had the U.S. not created a place for these people to organize, get to know each other, and then you know become friends and move on from there. But the the interesting thing, Rania, is that you didn't need Afghanistan because, after all, um, the Saudis from 1964 onwards in the World Muslim League had been organizing um, this section of the very far right wing uh, Islamists, you know, from 1964. And it's interesting where they put their eggs is where the omelet uh, were made. That's a good point. They put yeah. their eggs in Chechnya and Dagestan, and you saw a massive war in Chechnya and Dagestan. Uh, they put their eggs later for sure in northern syria i mean mm-hmm. you know look um, the syrian government allowed these saudi preachers to come and set up their mosques in in aleppo uh, in idlib um, you know all across northern syria actually and when there was the drought and there was that massive displacement of northern syrian peoples into into aleppo um, particularly aleppo but also into um, sections of of the area around uh Damascus including the south as Dara and so on these fellows took refuge in these saudi mosques they got fellowship from saudi money that was the relief money and so on that sets up the terms for the uprising so actually you didn't need afghanistan uh you know you you could you did this in the deserts in libya you know they they did go to afghanistan and train you know in the jihad they all fought and so on but that could have been anywhere in the world that's what i'm saying it, it yeah that's a good point here. You know, yeah. it wasn't like something out of Afghanistan that Afghanistan drew them and so on. It's not Afghanistan's fault, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, no, you know? no, no, of course. I, I'm of trying course. to say, don't blame Afghanistan, guys. It's just a beautiful place where it's awash a with wealth. You know, the Afghan government of uh, Hamid Karzai said they are sitting on three trillion dollars of gold, of, uh, of 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 precious metals, including lapis lazuli and so on. You know, it's an extremely rich country which has been impoverished, and and the yeah. people are delightful people. Um, you know, of, of different ethnicities, very diverse place, and it has an Islam that is so rich and complicated. You know, it's not the Saudi kind of Islam. So what what I'm just trying to go round and round to say is that of course it's true that that the um, Al Qaeda roots itself in 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 Afghanistan. Of course, all that's true. um but it could have rooted itself elsewhere now the very fact that it did root itself in afghanistan has a lot to do as you said with the game that the cia played um not from 1979 it actually brzezinski's late that's the point i think um this all begins in 1973 uh, i- i- during the nixon administration some of these games begin um mm-hmm. despite the fact that the government of zulfikar ali bhutto was not keen Uh, the CIA was already there. And I know this because I interviewed Chuck Cogan, who was the um, he was in charge of operations, director of operations for that whole region. You know, basically from Lebanon uh, out to Afghanistan. But he was based in Tehran. Um, you know, Chuck told me or repeatedly that you know their dirty tricks began long before Brzezinski and Carter and so on. Um, and and I think that's that's why I insisted on the point, Rania. about the liberal government being undermined in afghanistan it's not like the cia was sitting next to mahmud daud saying you know how should we take care of the communists they were sitting across the border with burhanuddin rabbani and saying how do we overthrow That's the liberals crazy. That's crazy, That's crazy, right? Yeah. That's And I mean crazy. I guess the same you could also I guess you could also say it's like the same um the same kind of thing the us did in egypt in the 50s right backing the muslim brotherhood uh against uh nasser and the sort of like arab nationalism so it is you're right it's not like brzezinski thought of this first right of using religion against communism or against liberalism even or, or any sort of nationalism that wants to project some sort of sovereignty and protect it um but i guess you know from 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 there i would want to ask you and this is more locally about afghanistan just the way it gets talked about the way the countryside in particular there's this mm-hmm. obsession in western media of presenting this binary of Afghanistan of of urban versus countryside right and the urban areas are where women want rights and are are more educated and the countryside just wants to stay in the stone age um this is a constant theme i see from you know the new york times 
to the New Yorker to there's God, there's so many New York based publications, but maybe that's the problem. But I guess my question for you is, you know, was this inevitable? that Afghanistan would end up in the hands of the Taliban like this. We know, obviously there are, it's not It's not incorrect to say there are some very regressive forces in Afghan society as there are in many societies, but were they destined to win? You know, could they have won so much power across Afghanistan without the backing of imperialists going back to, to the early, you know, the early 1900s? And I, I specifically remember an anecdote that you use in your piece from, from the late 1920s, I think it is, where the queen of Afghanistan is on a trip to France and she meets the, and you can you can correct this if I get any of it wrong, but she meets like the French leader at the time, uh, unveiled, and the British uh, take photographs of this meeting and then they push it out through Afghanistan, uh, particularly to provoke and anger the conservatives. Um, so this is just an ongoing theme. So I guess, yeah, is was it inevitable that Afghanistan would end up in the hands of regressive forces? And I kind of know the answer to that, but I would like you to to kind of respond to that constant uh, narrative that we see. Well, in in human history, nothing is inevitable. I mean, the the you know even the the onward march to socialism is not inevitable. I mean, we can see the barbarities that have inflicted the planet now. You know, uh, Rosa Luxemburg's great line, socialism or barbarism. Well, you can go either way, guys. There's no inevitability. <laughs> you know, you have yeah. to fight to make the world better. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make, that Afghanistan was posed with a whole set of choices. And the Afghan people were in a long struggle. Um, in 1973, when Rabani goes across the border, he might have become a footnote in history. You know, uh, look, uh, you know, Rania, you're, you're in Lebanon, for instance, you know. Um, you know, we have seen in, in the Middle East or rather in West Asia, so many forces that have become footnotes uh, in history. You know, they they just didn't succeed and their projects mm -hmm. failed, but they linger. You know, they, they are still around. And I don't want to name any of them uh, because in Lebanon, nobody likes to feel like they are a footnote. But there are many <laughs> there are many forces that I know. And I've interviewed people in in, in and around Beirut that you know, they're never going to be able to have an effective political project in the region any longer, but they still exist and so on. Mm -hmm. Rabani would have been that footnote. He would have been gone to teaching maybe in the University of Peshawar. He taught Islamic theology. Hekmatyar would have become a heroin, you know, smuggler, <laughs> which basically he was. Ahmad yeah. Shah Matud, who was, you know, a sanctimonious uh, Islamist, would have gone around, you know, be being a preacher maybe, you know, of some kind. Uh, all of this could have happened and then a opening could have taken place. Afghanistan could have gone in a direction. And, and this is what's interesting. You know, the reform agenda in Afghanistan, when it opens in the 1910s, is not entirely, uh, it's not motivated by Britain or the United States or something. It was inspired by the fact that Mahmoud Beg Tarzi returns to Afghanistan, his home, from exile in, in, in the Ottoman Empire. Um, while Tarzi was in the Ottoman Empire, he imbibed all the energy of the Tanzimat reforms. He learned about what was happening inside uh, Anatolia, but also Syria. I mean, um, you know, his wife, uh, uh, Asma, was born in, 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 in Damascus in 1877. So they brought that whole history into Afghanistan and, and their daughter, uh, marries King Amanullah and becomes Queen Suraya. I mean, these were powerful people, but they carried the whole Ottoman uh, reform agenda, you know, which in the Ottoman Empire provokes the young Turks and then you get, you know, Kamal Ataturk and so on. Afghanistan could have had that history. You know, it's plausible that, um, that somebody could have become like Ataturk. In fact, I have often suspected that Mahmoud Daoud, who becomes this liberal aristocrat, he imagined himself as a kind of Ataturk, you know, an Ataturk who wore suits. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I've often felt that, that, you know, they were, th this was their, they were rooted in that world. They were not looking to New York and London and so on, or even Moscow. You know, they had their own reform agenda. Now, Rabani would have been a, a, a languishing professor at the University of Peshawar. Uh, Mahmoud Daoud and maybe in association with the communists could have created a new agenda. Afghanistan would have been in a different place today and could very well have been. Look, you know, you travel in, in Badakhshan and these provinces in the northern part of Afghanistan and you see young men and women working in the mines, you know, mining for lapis lazuli and so on. 
uh, you see them working outside Faisabad. I mean, these are hardworking people. Uh, you know, if if they were in a movement where the miners created a miners union, where they democratized their thinking through the struggle, um, you know, for justice as miners. If in the countryside in Helmand province, there was a movement for land reform. I mean, you would have a very different Afghanistan today. Uh, rather than put the hand quickly to the gun to shoot somebody, they would have put their, you know, uh, their, their thinking caps on and gone on a march and tried to liberate their country. And that possibility was very much there in the 1970s. You know, I, I find every once in a while on social media, people uh, post pictures of women in mini skirts in the universities as a symbol yeah. of modernity. I find that a little offensive, actually, because it doesn't actually, it, it's correct that Afghanistan in the 70s was on the edge of a new period. But that's not the image that I think of. I think of those uh, literacy workers sitting in the mm -hmm. countryside, sitting on the ground, surrounded by men and women, uh, teaching them how to read and write. You know, that's the actual photograph, Rania. That's the actual photograph of the possibilities of Afghanistan. And I wanted to ask you just like a couple more questions before we wrap here. You know, moving to the U.S. withdrawal, I know we've mostly been talking about the sort of buried history that we don't get to hear so much about. But uh, shifting to the recent U.S. withdrawal, I'm curious your thoughts on... And again, I'm asking you because I can't ask Joe Biden, but I'm curious your thoughts on, you know, why do you believe that the U.S. withdrew now? And, and, and now they're actually responding in, I think, a very cruel way, which is after, after spending the last 20 years really building nothing and then just like leaving and kind of pouring gasoline on the country on their way out, the U.S. is now sanctioning. Uh, the Taliban, which is the sitting government in Afghanistan and causing basically an economic collapse across the country. Now all the aid money has, you know, fled the country. They've frozen their central bank assets. And sitting in a country myself that's experiencing a pretty devastating economic collapse, Lebanon, um, I can't imagine the, the, the even worse toll that would take on a country that's been at war for 20 years. Um, so now the U S is sanctioning the country, but why do you think they withdrew, withdrew and why are they reacting like this? Is there a geostrategic reason for withdrawing now? You know, I did say, I did hear Biden say in, in several of his speeches that one of the reasons is we have to focus on China. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, first I would like to say that I know you're in, in Beirut, in Lebanon, and I know there are rolling power cuts, electricity cuts and so on. Uh, I'd like you to know, Rania, that after spending $2.26 trillion uh, in Afghanistan, the United States bill is about that, 65% um, mm -hmm. of Afghan people do not have an electricity connection. So um, this is in 2021. And I know that people in Lebanon complain, say the power gets cut, but at least you have a connection to your house. 65% mm -hmm. of Afghans do not have a power connection. Half of Afghanistan people are in poverty. That's just let's just put that out there. Um, yes, I think they did uh, withdraw in a humiliating way from the from Afghanistan uh, because they want to refocus on China. I think that was it. And I think there was a kind of exhaustion drift uh, regarding this war. What was really interesting was the deceit of the uh, U.S. political and military class. Um, you know, Joe Biden said we didn't realize the Afghan army was going to collapse so fast in, in about 10, 11 days. Uh, he said, you know, why didn't they fight as if that it's their problem? Uh, Lloyd Austin, defense secretary, said we didn't know there was an intelligence failure and so on. I find it all very hard to believe. And you don't need to listen to me. Um, you really don't need to listen to me because, um, you know, uh, Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, was on CNN. And what Imran said is, is very much worth taking uh, to heart. He said that in 2008, he visited the United States, met with uh, Joe Biden, met with John Kerry, vice president and secretary of state. And he told them that you're losing the war. You know, right now you have about 150,000 troops. You should now, from a position of military strength, sue for peace with the Taliban. Don't wait it out. That's what he claims he told them. Uh, they have not denied what he said. Then he said in 2010, uh, chief of military staff from Pakistan went to meet Obama personally, told him you're losing the war. The Afghan army is not going to be able to fight when, when you leave. You've got to sue for peace. That's what Imran Khan told CNN uh, just a few days ago. Now, that's interesting. I mean, look, the uh, uh, special inspector general of the United States, 
on Afghanistan in every annual report said that the, the Afghan army is not going to be able to stand up. It's a ghost army and so on. So it, this was in the public domain, you know, the SIGAR reports, the Special Inspector General report in the public. You can download the PDFs. How is it that Lloyd Austin now can say there was an intelligence failure? What do they mean by that? I mean, they hoodwink people <laughs> over and over and over again. Um, there was no good way for them to withdraw, frankly, in the last period. Perhaps Imran Khan was right. In 20, 2008, 100, 150,000 troops in, uh, in Afghanistan. Maybe they could have sat down with the Taliban and said, we are now demanding an agreement with you. Let's get it done with. Maybe it would have been different then. Now the Taliban is in charge. Um, in just about a week, they swept the northern provinces. Um, that was should have come as a great humiliation to the Northern Alliance because you know these are provinces with um, many of them majority Tajiks and others. Um, they just welcomed the Taliban. Uh, why this needs to be understood and and thought through. But certainly, um, you know, the United States lost this war. It was a humiliating departure. Um, the United States lost this war, and I don't see any of the sitting generals right now denying that. Um, in fact, General Milley, who, who has been in the news recently uh, regarding, you know, the warnings he had given the Chinese, telling them, look, we are not trying to attack you. That is the United States and so on. Um, he went before uh, the U.S. government recently and said, look, you know, the uh, withdrawal was a tactical victory, meaning got all the troops out, but it was a strategic defeat. That was his terms, a strategic defeat. I think they were trying to, they knew that there was no, they would just, you know, draw this out. There was no way to actually win in Afghanistan and they needed to uh, focus attention on China. I mean, other people have other kinds of theories, but I think, you know, sometimes Rania, um, the most obvious <laughs> answer is the correct one. Right. It's the answer that they're actually telling us, too. And sometimes they, they mean what they say. I mean, it's it really is just incredible the point you made about two point six trillion dollars being spent and 65 percent of Afghans having no electricity. I mean, in a way, you're talking about people welcoming the Taliban. It's like imagine what the U.S. had to have done for 20 years to make the Taliban look good. Um, it's a really nasty organization. So there you have it. Anyway, but I guess this, Rania, I have to say this is the second time that the uh, history has made the Taliban look good because when they came to power <laughs> in 1996, they were welcomed by some sections, large sections of Afghan society. Similar now. Now the issue is, of course, they are socially regressive force. Uh, it's an anti-woman force. It has serious problems with uh, diversity of all kinds and so on, and they must be challenged. But they will be challenged from within Afghanistan. We've already seen protests. Let the Afghan people settle accounts with the Taliban. I don't think aerial bombardment is going to do the job. No, <laughs> I don't think so either. And actually, that kind of feeds into the last question I have for you, which I, I think, you know, is, is more just like a, a reflection from your end here. Um, what's the takeaway from all this? You know, what should our position moving forward be as leftists? So, you know, on the one hand, it's tempting to cheer an indigenous movement expelling imperialist occupiers, right? But on the other hand, when that movement is the Taliban, it's hard to find uh, much common ground with them, as, as you mentioned. You know, obviously the Taliban's horrendous, but like, like you said, the U.S. military aerial bombardment are not and never were the answer. So, so what should our, our takeaway from all of this be? Well, firstly, I, I would never cheer the Taliban taking Kabul. Uh, I, I have a different opinion. My opinion is I'm very glad the United States is gone, uh, and, or at least overtly uh, gone. I don't know what covert activities they're doing, but they're gone overtly. I'm very happy for that. Um, the Taliban is in power. That's regrettable, totally regrettable. There is nothing good about that. N nothing good will come from this government. Um, you know, the, I, I just reported a piece about Badakhshan province in the north. Uh, because that's where the current economy minister comes from. Uh, you know, he's the only Tajik in the cabinet. And he's going to have his hands, you know, he, it's very hard for them to put forward an economic agenda. Plus, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini was once quoted, or maybe it was apocryphal, as saying econ economics is for donkeys. Not in the modern world. It's certainly not for donkeys in the modern world. you got to take it really seriously. And I just don't think the Taliban are serious people when it comes to, you know, things like economics, for governing, governing, governing improving yeah. the well-being of people and so on. I don't think they're serious people. You know, uh, they may have all kinds of social problems, you know, 
the misogyny and so on that's all true but the other great problem they have is they're just not serious at building a modern state it seems to me uh, i mean the turks offered to run kabul airport for them you know because you know they don't have the the wherewithal the, the technical capacity and so on and and they immediately said no we'll do it and they put you know this guy who has no technical competence to be the vice chancellor of kabul university they just don't seem serious you know yeah they, like who's going to do air traffic control at the taliban like that's actually yeah, kind of quite alarming serious, you know? yeah yeah so my my feeling is that right now we have to look in two directions for if we actually care about afghanistan and its people one is you got to trust the capacity of this long history that goes back to um the founding of the journal called sirajul akbar um in 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 the 1920s you know this great uh uh you know period of reform that reform agenda which included the communists it's still there in afghanistan you know i i remember these communists in the period when hamid karzai was the president they had started ngos and they were part of this and that save the children you know they were there um they are going to have to regroup they are going to have to build their strength and so on afghanistan is going to have to build its own mass struggles struggles for land reform struggles against hunger and so on we're going to see this happen we've already seen bits and pieces of it you, the afghans uh, no longer i think are going to benefit from somebody giving them arms to start a war people are exhausted of war they've been fighting a war since the 1970s they really don't want that so let's see if an if the taliban will tolerate an opening a political opening you know where people start demonstrating and so on that's on the one side secondly uh, i would very much like to see the shanghai cooperation organization uh, founded in the summer of 2001 includes 40% of the world's people in it uh, by the way it's the second largest political body after the un um, it's basically seized on the problem of afghanistan it has india pakistan Iran the central asian countries russia china all of them are part of the sco let them come up with a regional plan you know yeah. let them try to explain to the taliban leadership that listen you know you want you're a landlocked country you know you're going to access a trade and so on you've got to really cool it on some of your extremism um imran khan in the interview with cnn made it clear already i think that pakistan is not going to um, you know welcome problems inside pakistan in the borderland areas of waziristan and northern baluchistan so that's going to be um th their deal in fact one of the most wish vicious groups that operated in pakistan the haqqani network is now you know very very well ensconced in the new government in in pakistan in afghanistan including sirajuddin haqqani who's like a, a you know un terrorist list so let's <laughs> see what pressure can be put on these people you know yeah, by the yeah. regional actors let's give the regional actors and the afghan people some time Yeah and that makes sense too is the regional actors especially i mean russia china uh india iran these are countries that what happens in afghanistan actually impacts their own stability so they have a stake in a stable afghanistan whereas the us on the other side of the world like doesn't really care and it doesn't matter um that said vj thank you so much for coming on and breaking all this down i really appreciate it please anytime